Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us today for ServiceNow at Scale, tips for driving large enterprise adoption. Uh, I'm Lindsay, Director of Marketing here at Beyond 20, and I'm so lucky to be joined today by Joe Aranzulo and Ryan Dinwiddie. Um, I'm here just at the top for some small amount of ado, and then I will pass it over to Ryan. So a little bit about Beyond 20. Um, we are a transformation accelerator is what we call ourselves, and we do that in three ways through uh, best practice training, consulting, and uh, technology implementation. So that third one is probably why you're all here today. We are a ServiceNow premier partner. We also work with ShareWell and Beyond Trust, um, and we're an Axlos consulting partner, and we do a fair amount of ITIL training, the whole suite of ITIL training and cybersecurity training as well. Um, for those uh, govies among us, we are an 8A woman-owned small business, and we are among many others on the STARS-3 uh, contract. So. That's all for me. Uh, Ryan, tell us a little bit about yourself and Joe, and let's get this uh, show on the road. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone, uh, depending on which coast you live on. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Ryan Dinwiddie. I am a, the Chief Solution Architect uh, at Beyond20. Um, I am also a ServiceNow Certified Master Architect. So I spent the last decade or so of my life um, specifically focused on ServiceNow. Um, so I started out as a client in a client role as an administrator many, many years ago, uh, moved into a consulting role, and I've been there ever since. Um, I'd also like to introduce Joe Aranzulo. Hi, everybody. I'm Joe Aranzulo. I'm the Director of Service Delivery here at Beyond 20. I've also been on ServiceNow for about 10 years now, but I've been in IT for over 15 years. Thank you, Joe. Um, so for the next hour or so, thank you for joining us, but we want to talk about um, ServiceNow, but we're going to be talking about um, the essentials to driving adoption within your organizations and kind of ensuring long-term platform health and stability. Um, so one of those areas that we're going to do it at is um, by talking about establishing a ServiceNow Center of Excellence. Um, we also want to make sure that we're understanding guiding principles, um, exploring application governance, and talking about application roadmaps as well. Um, we're going to flip over a little bit to the people side of change within the organization, where we're going to talk through organizational change management. Um, we're going to shift our focus a little bit onto the mechanics of development for ServiceNow, um, and then kind of get a quick look into um, ensuring value with ServiceNow with, for your organization, both um, initially and then long-term value as well. So quick introduction on ServiceNow for those of you that may not be familiar with it. Um, so ServiceNow is what we refer to as the platform of platforms. Um, it is really kind of designed to um, workflow out parts of your business or all of your business. Um, so ServiceNow is going to be really one way that we've been working with a lot of different um, companies to aggregate their user experience. Um, so no matter the communication channel. So if you're wanting to really meet your employees where they are, whether they're working remote, whether they are um, working from their coffee table, whether they're working from the back of a van in the middle of the woods, um, we're really wanting to make sure that with this kind of like new normal of, you know, finally getting out of the COVID era, understanding that we're meeting our employees and meeting our customers where they are. Um, and ServiceNow has got that ability and that power. And we're also able to automate things within the business, uh, making sure that we're understanding the business workflows and workflowing those specific areas. Um, and ServiceNow isn't here to replace tools. That's one of the things I love about it is you kind of see down at the bottom of this slide, we talk about the systems of record. Um, ServiceNow is really going to be all about aggregating that user experience and kind of facilitating that data flow and that workflow between other systems of record. Um, so it's all about that user experience and making sure that we're engaging with our users um, and then kind of having a shared platform, um, shared data models, cutting down that silos that exist within the organization a little more um, and really wanting to centralize it. Yeah, and don't let this chart intimidate you or your org. ServiceNow itself started from really humble beginnings. I remember when I started it, I think it was just ITSM, but it's steadily grown over the years into the enterprise service management platform it is today. When considering where to start, think about what you want to get out of it. What do you want to solve for? What's your objective? So with that, um, let's talk about the ServiceNow Center of Excellence. So regardless of what you may define this as within your organization, Center of Excellence, program, 
Um, I've heard it called a lot of different things, but whatever you want to define it as, we really want to make sure that the IE is the same, that we're standardizing and centralizing the management of ServiceNow. So ServiceNow is an investment for your organization, and it needs to be treated as such. Um, over the years, we have learned that ServiceNow is so configurable, it benefits from guardrails like design um, standards and good practices. We've also found that ServiceNow benefits significantly from a lightweight governance model, and we're going to talk about each of the kind of areas in uh, around this circle today for defining your center of excellence. Um, ServiceNow, like everything in your organization, both the management of the application and the application itself really benefit from continual improvement. Um, and we also start to see some of the, the connections back to IDLE here as well, um, that being a big tenant of the IDLE framework for our continual improvement. So ServiceNow, like other applications as well, especially because it is a cloud application, it needs a stable monitored environment. So in order for your, as we determine production environment um, for ServiceNow, it needs to be solid, stable, ready to go, and a lot of that comes back to our design standards and good practices um, to make sure that we're ensuring a high quality production environment, a stable production environment um, that's available across your organization. Um, and finally, we're going to wrap today by talking about kind of like strong teams of solid knowledge. Um, and a lot of that also has ties back into our design standards, our good practices, um, and our governance as well. Um, so Joe and I have both set up um, centers of excellence for clients. Um, most recently, I was working with a large U.S.-based health insurance company. Um, they were a pre-existing ServiceNow customer, but the introduction of um, governance really gave them the ability to um, have a more stable production environment, speed up their quality or speed up their development, excuse me, and bump up the quality. Um, so just kind of a, a few simple additions around um, standards of development and lightweight governance was really able to have a big impact on, on their development processes and their environments. Oh, absolutely. A few years ago, I was working with a, a large medical device manufacturing firm. They just went through a, a, a divestiture and were given only a finite amount of time to stand on their own two feet with service management. So this effort spanned many business units, uh, IT, uh, portfolio management, uh, asset management, and they had to send them multiple modules across the platform, as you can imagine. So considering the time we had, we had to have multiple work streams running in parallel, and that also meant having several different teams all working concurrently. What helped us to conduct that symphony was establishing a center of excellence. With this cohesive approach, we are best equipped to promote visibility to stakeholders. You know, where's my stuff? Unifying development standards, make sure we're all kind of following the same sheet of music, coordinate our efforts, especially when it came to release planning, because we had different release cadence across the groups, uh, stay in constant communication across the teams, paramount, and support each other when challenges were encountered. This greatly helped maintain a very busy kitchen with a lot of cooks to achieve successful outcomes. And Joe, I love this example because this, this is actually a client that Joe and I worked on together um, oh, in yeah. a previous life. And we were both leading separate teams while establishing, while Joe was establishing the governance for this. So it's kind of nice to be able to live it firsthand and then have that experience to take on to, to other clients as well. Absolutely. Okay. So from there, I want to talk about guiding principles. So kind of another tenant that you see coming back from, from IDLE, um, guiding principles within ServiceNow these really fall under that design standards and good practices kind of pillar from the COE that we talked about. Um, but I am a huge fan of guiding principles. It's nice to have a published, you know, I, I don't know that necessarily doctrine is the right word, but, you know, a published set of visible principles that we are abiding by when we're using something like ServiceNow. And when I say using, I mean, managing it, developing it, you know, doing the ongoing support activities, qualifying new demands for it. Um, all of those things kind of come down to guiding principles. Um, and one of the, the very top of the pyramid, which I think is, is coming to focus quite a bit more in the last couple of years, um, and everybody's probably tired of hearing the word COVID on webinars, but um, I think it really has done a lot for IT to be able to refocus on thinking about experience first. Um, and another kind of tenant of that is when we talk about you know, another overplay term, I think some, but the great resignation where we're needing to have kind of a competitive advantage to be able to attract talent within our organizations. And I think thinking experience first is a great example of that. 
um, making sure that we're offering the ability to um, provide high quality service to our employees to make sure that we're retaining them. Um, another really good guiding principle is kind of driving change and challenging, challenging that status quo. Um, I know that this is another one of Joe's favorites that just because we've always done it that way, that is one of the worst answers I get as a consultant. Um, it's an immediate, like, I want to dig into that because that, that makes me question things. Um, so always asking why. Um, quickest path to value is another one. When we talk about like agile frameworks and agile methodologies, um, having that quickest path to value is a good way to get something in front of our end users. Um, so incremental progress is something that I will always beat the drum on as a consultant and always recommend to clients that get something out there, get it live, get some feedback on it and make changes. Um, I think, and probably for a good reason, a lot of the the like very large scale implementations that take three years to roll out a product, um, I think those days are, are a little bit behind us. And I think that's great because so much changes in three years anymore that there isn't a lot of time to be able to get feedback from users um, to be able to make something as good as possible or as best as possible. Um, and kind of one of the, the final like large scale guiding principles is out of box first. So ServiceNow comes with a baseline set of configuration and we always recommend to start to that first um, because that's going to be kind of the foundational attribute for um, how often we can upgrade, how quickly we can rapidly adopt new applications from ServiceNow. All of these things come back to out of box. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in governance. Um, but that's to me is a big thing around governance. And you probably heard it quite a bit um, in the, the ServiceNow ecosystem, but it really is a meaningful item. So supporting our guiding principles, I really want to talk about architecture. So I am absolutely, I mean, as an architect for um, the last decade or so, architecture is kind of where I live and breathe very much like Joe in his previous life. Um, but architecture within ServiceNow is really going to be about simplification in this example um, and making sure that we're configuring, we're integrating, and then we're finally customizing. Um, but I'm also a big fan of leveraging ServiceNow to enable citizen developers, um, get the development in the hands as much as we can of the business users, um, not just spreading out, but because they know those processes better. Um, and also having kind of forward looking reusable um, pieces. So that's one of the big things that I like about ServiceNow is because it's a unified shared platform, we have the ability to leverage a lot of reuse and a lot of foundational areas. And when it comes to design, like Ryan said, out of the box, ServiceNow provides a great place to start when it comes to UX design. So it's important to follow that model to build a system that's intuitive and intelligent. The more processes that can be automated behind a user-friendly front end, the more consistent the user experience will be. So building a good framework for the front end will enable catalog and knowledge admins the ability to continue adding content with low code or no code functions so you can continue to grow on your own. Okay. Um, so one of the other big kind of tenets for guiding principle is the world runs on data. And um, I don't normally like to introduce an acronym without defining it, but I want to define it here. So over the last couple of years, um, out of the, the many, many projects, ServiceNow and the partners in the ecosystem have worked together to create um, what, what ServiceNow has defined the CSDM or the Common Services Data Model. So the Common Services Data Model, because we're looking at a shared platform with shared data, um, we're wanting to make sure that we've got some framework to how we approach that data. When we talk about you know, cost centers, departments, locations, those kinds of things that are going to be used across you know, IT, human resources, asset management, you know, business management, all of those different areas within ServiceNow, it can sometimes be hard to identify within an organization what the master set of truth is for some of that data. So having good foundational, clean, high quality data that we're starting service now with is gonna be essential. Um, and then making sure that we're able to clean that data and tie it back to a system of record um, before we bring it into service now. Yeah, and that all points to governance. Now, when em embarking on this journey, it's very easy for your eyes to get larger than your stomach. And like Ryan said, iterative success will always be delayed perfection. So always keep your problem statement and desired outcome in mind. Remember that Rome wasn't built in a day, or actually that was two releases ago. San Diego wasn't built in a day. 
The overarching goal is to provide a product that is scalable, supportable, and reliable. We'll dig more into how establishing governance is the underpinning of a successful deployment and platform adoption over the next few slides. So let's start by defining governance. Governance is the identification of how decisions are made and applied to accelerate outcomes with ServiceNow. Specifically, governance is about detailing what decisions need to be made and when, who needs to be involved in decision-making, and the processes and activities used to arrive at those decisions. Uh, I've seen myself and participated in a few forms of that governance that work with past customers. And Ryan, I know you, uh, we were on the same account together, but I know you've also played a part in platform governance with some of your other projects. Yeah, Joe, and it's it's interesting um, being a, a consultant and sitting on an organization's like executive and technical boards um, to be able to provide that input and guidance guidance is, is pretty amazing. Um, to be able to you know help make those decisions, help shape where that organization is going with ServiceNow, um, and kind of understand that a little bit. So with that, let's take a look on take a look at what kind of exactly we're we're recommending when it comes to a governance process. So um, if you're new to ServiceNow or you're already live, once the word is out about ServiceNow, everyone is going to want in. And that may, may sound like a little bit of hubris, um, but it, it honestly is not being fully transparent with the amount of customers that we've worked with in the past that once somebody understands and sees the power of ServiceNow and the workflow potential, all of these people kind of come out of the woodwork about like, I've got this thing, can ServiceNow do that? Um, and the answer is, you know, almost always yes. Um, but the thing is, what do we do with all of those questions? So ServiceNow governance is really going to be like twofold to be able to handle the application itself, handle the management of the platform, handle the development. But then there's the other side of, you know, how do we manage what's coming in and the requests for um, what, what people are looking for um, within ServiceNow. So really the first way we do that is to define a common intake for all of those. And once we've got that common intake, we're also going to define where we're going with the platform. So we kind of recommend an executive steering board for um, not only organizational buy-in to ServiceNow, but they're going to have some, some responsibilities around defining ServiceNow vision and strategy, but also allocating um, budgets and resources to this project. Nothing gets done in an organization without having executive buy-in, and this is one way to be able to directly tap them in and provide a little bit of accountability and ownership from them. From there too, then we want to talk about kind of the, the portfolio side of it. Um, with the portfolio side, we want to make sure that we're talking about the demand board. So with the demand board, we're talking about the platform and um, process owners, and they're going to be able to intake those requests of, I want to move maybe my accounts receivable follow-ups into here, or maybe I want to expand a little bit of human resources and offer um, maybe an alumni portal, or there are all these different things that I can potentially have to run through my demand boards. And the demand boards will be working um, with the executive steering boards as well to make sure that they are communicating and understanding that ServiceNow vision and strategy to kind of qualify those demands as they're coming in and figure out where they would fit. Um, and then kind of on the final side of that is going to be the technical side. And on the technical side, this is where we're going to have our technical governance board. Um, this is where we're going to have our IT leaders, technical architects, enterprise architects within your organization. Um, they're really going to be responsible for setting the technical policies and standards. So making sure that we're ensuring long-term platform health and stability by staying out of box, minimizing customization. Um, that's really going to be where the technical governance board comes into play. Um, and this is really going to be where we're going to um, assign accountability for certain groups. Um, and this requires the groups to work together, which is incredibly important. Um, these groups can't make decisions within isolation. They can't be in silos. So this is going to be kind of our recommendation for kind of a lightweight governance to approach. Um, it can be changed like any framework to and adapted to within your organization. Um, but really, it's going to be about making sure that we've got people that are responsible for looking at the strategy of service now, looking at what's incoming, and then looking at the quality of work and adherence to the standards that we've set um, within service now.
yeah, when I listen to this and think about some of my longer running projects and those that had a lot of velocity and throughput, but what I what they all shared were all these elements of governance set up, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And I remember playing different parts in these boards and continue to do that today. Uh, a long time ago at the management consulting firm, their platform was what they used to conduct business. That's how they made money. So we established a, a wonderful feedback cycle with their demand board, their, their stakeholders, their business units of how they needed the platform to function for them to be successful day to day. For that customer, I was also on the demand board, qualifying what stakeholders were asking for, finding where that fits on their roadmap, planning sprints. Uh, my other role there was on the technical board, obviously, as a, as a consultant. I was the voice of the platform. It was my responsibility to analyze incoming demands, deem what was possible, uh, decide what we could offer the stakeholders after comparing what they want to our guiding principles, like stay out of the box and development standards we had established and assessing technical debt that their changes would introduce. Fast forward a few years, I was with another customer where I was purely on the technical governance side of the house. It was my job to be the advocate for the platform like before, ensure the work performed was to our set standard. All of the work was vetted, tested, documented, this meant coordinating not only with the client-side product owners, executive sponsors, and developers, but also with the other vendors in the system and implementers that were involved. A good bit of that, my role there was establishing what our development standards were, or setting policy in alignment with our guiding principles and with the executive sponsor and product owner, and knowing where and what each team was up to at any given time. Now in my role as director of service delivery, I find it puts me more a member of the executive steering board. I'm more focused on achieving outcomes instead of the tactical minutia of daily operations. I'm more focused on like quarterly or yearly KPIs or milestones to help accelerate our business. So now landing at this board finally, uh, what I find is how strongly I depend on those two other boards to provide what is needed to help me and my organization meet those goals. So wearing all these hats, it just gives me a true appreciation for what each of these boards offers. They offer a balance and a harmony with each other. The executive team wants to achieve an outcome, always moving forward. But in order to do that, they need a demand board to bring in feedback, prompt statements, ideas of what good looks like to drive continual improvement. And a tactical board ensures that the platform cannot only do these things, but do so in a way that keeps things running smoothly minimizes risk, and stays nimble enough to support future growth. Which brings us to the roadmap. So you have your COE established, the governance boards are assembled. Let's go, what's next? Well, <clears throat> it's time to define the roadmap. And with the roadmap, you start to put pen to paper on what achieving your vision will look like. You will consult with the technical board for what makes sense on the platform, along with considering future product releases, you lean on the executive board for sponsorship and the demand board. And with their help, you're able to illustrate where the pieces fit across your organization. So why bother? It's easy to see a keynote at Knowledge or even one of these webinars and have your eyes go wide. You see some super slick functionality and immediately you start thinking, how that can help your company make work better, to steal a phrase. What you typically don't see though, is behind the flashy demo is all the building blocks that went, that went into enabling your platform to provide this kind of value and wow factor. Now, when I get to interact with customers at events, something I commonly hear is, how do I get what I just saw in that presentation to be in my instance? Now, the excitement is great. Talking to people enthused about the platform is one of the more rewarding aspects of my job. My advice to those customers is don't rush, don't skip steps, don't cut corners. At the same time, assure them they don't need to boil the ocean with a single massive release as a means to quickly get to what they saw in the presentation. What I do recommend for those customers is lay out your roadmap. Take me, for example. Me, I, I haven't run from or for anything in a very long time. So it'd be crazy of me to say, I wanna run a 10K next week. Well, that's because I need to follow a path to achieve that outcome. There are things I can start doing right away, which will eventually unlock my ability to move on to the next phase of my journey, and then the next phase of my journey until I can finally accomplish what I set out to do. I need to define what my roadmap is. Now, a roadmap, like you see in front of you, it doesn't need to be a large, exhaustive document. 
You don't need to account for every day of every week, every hour, every day, every minute of every hour. All the roadmap needs to achieve is a high level direction and plan. And that great demo we saw at Knowledge, we want that dashboard. We want that intelligence in our platform. That's our objective. It's something that would take the pressure off the service desk or create efficiencies or save the company a lot of money long-term. So what does our roadmap look like? Well, first start from where you are, ITO principle. How's your foundational data? Is it accurate? Uh, is it governed? What's your CMDB look like? Are you tracking on the CIs that you support or that support your business? With a solid bedrock, like CMDB up front, that will help you support the IT service management processes. You can identify incidents. Uh, you can do an RCA on problem and it'll help drive your change process. And already you're realizing value of the platform while only being at the very beginning of the journey. Moving on from that, now you're in the service catalog. You're defining your service offerings for your customers, building out your catalog taxonomy, maybe even leveraging IT asset management to provide the backbone of the services you provide, or leveraging knowledge management to help the users help themselves. All the while, keeping your platform current on the upgrade path and service now, with each release bringing additional functionality to your platform while your work to date continues unlocking more opportunities. So now that the foundation is poured and the walls are stood up, you can start to explore these cool features you saw demonstrated, things like AI, mobile, chat, virtual agent, and many others. So as you follow this roadmap left to right, your governance boards are what are providing the fuel for the engine, demand, keep your things running smoothly and ready to scale, technical, while striving towards your strategic vision for the platform, your steering committee. So all of this sounds great, but one of the most crucial components for introducing all this, something assumed and definitely deserves more credit is OCM. You're right there, Joe. So OCM is so very important. Um, and when we say OCM, we mean organizational change management. So you'll notice at the very bottom of the roadmap here, um, it runs the full length of our roadmap because like continual improvement, like governance, it never goes away and it never should. Um, so OCM or organizational change management is going to be um, essential and it's one of those kind of pillar items. Um, so if you're not super familiar with what OCM is, it's really going to be about managing the people side of the change. Um, so when Joe and I were getting ready for this webinar, we were kind of joking about um, how much we hate that when you go to a supermarket and you go to the same supermarket every time and things are in a different spot. That just drives me absolutely crazy. Um, like that could, you know, my resistance to that change would be nullified if there was a little map on the shopping cart or something, you know, that would tell me that maybe the things I used to buy in this aisle are now over here. Um, so that's really going to be kind of what I think about in my, my relatable example for OCM is making sure that we are, you know, kind of checking the, the attitude of the individuals that are getting targeted for the change, um, managing their behavior and then as a result of that change, addressing the culture. So we're wanting to make sure that um, if we're completely replacing our ITSM tool, completely swapping out our you know, human resources tool, changing how we deal with software asset management, all of those things are going to impact and affect the people that are, um, that are doing day-to-day -day jobs in these areas. So we wanna make sure that we're caring about them just as much, or in my opinion, more than the technical aspect of that. Um, and we're gonna be doing a lot of that through defined processes, tools, and techniques. So there's a whole area of study out there specifically around organizational change. Um, and that's something that should be really coming across in, um, in all of the projects. And adoption is really gonna be key when discussing OCM, like a perfectly rolled out system that has a flawless technical and project implementation. But if there's no adoption, has that really been successful? Oh, absolutely. The most successful implementations I've seen weren't those that had the most whiz-bang, latest and greatest cutting-edge technology solutions in them, but those that had a strong plan for OCM to bring everyone along for the ride. So the big question of why. So I think we've given you a little bit of why in the last slide, um, but I'm going to kind of hit that hit that hammer a little bit again that OTM is critical for driving adoption. So um, IT has always and traditionally been not as focused on uh, employee experience 
And I've seen that change over the last couple of years, and I'm really excited by that change. Um, we're no longer managing IT so much on metrics as we are um, focusing on what was the employee experience? Did we get their ask satisfied? Are they happy? So, so much of that also comes back to OCM. Um, and that, that employee experience focus isn't just outward looking towards the customer and end user. It needs to be inward looking towards those agents and those fulfillers that are working within ServiceNow. So they can sometimes be an often um, like forgotten group that we need to take care of because they're the ones that are facilitating that work. Um, so OCM really helps people understand the benefits of the change and be prepared for it. Um, it also helps kind of build that team's um, efficiency. So we're going to help them drive adoption of the tool. We're going to help them get proficient at the tool faster, leading to higher productivity. And then we also want to give them the space with OCM to feel comfortable to have that buy-in to start looking at continual improvement. So with continual improvement, then we want to talk about um, what comes out of OCM. So out of OCM, we typically see improved ROI and we see acceleration on that transformation. So a recent Gartner study um, has noted that projects with OCM are 70% more likely to stay on time and in budget um, just due to that organizational buy-in. So OCM has to be part of every single project. Um, one of the things I will caution you on too is don't, um, don't be tempted to cut corners on a statement of work by dropping OCM. Um, that's something that partners and will push back on for good reason because it's needed. Um, also, if you're getting to the point where you're starting or working on a service now implementation, um, if your partner isn't bringing up organizational change management, um, that's a that's an issue from my perspective. Oh, totally. Uh, when you bring in that vendor with the implementation, one of the things that separates a partner from just an implementer is their preparedness and emphasis on a strong OCM plan. Partners like Beyond 20 bring with them an OCM practice that can provide comprehensive OCM guidance. That's what you're after. Uh, and I think back to OCM gone wrong. And some time ago, I was working with a customer. They had a tight timeline, a tight budget. So they, they cut OCM from their project. Uh, the project went great. The team did great work to identify needs, opportunities to, to build and bring them to fruition. While the implementation was successful, user adoption wasn't. The users didn't use the system the way we, we thought they would throughout design. And people weren't made aware of the change and therefore they didn't like working on the platform. They ended up just sticking to what they were doing before, like spreadsheets, Microsoft Access, I, I kid. Um, MS Teams, instead of using the platform and realizing the value, that lack of OCM gave way to the users feeling like ServiceNow just happened to me instead of bringing me along for the journey to understand the change and why it can really help my day-to-day -day activities. They felt more or less it was just shoved in front of them and they were told, this is what we use, that's it. So as you can imagine, that lack of OCM brought about a bit of resistance to embracing the platform despite all the efforts of the project team. So the moral of the story is, please don't discount OCM. And to that point, Joe, if I had to pick on a specific process area, I would think that, you know, from my experience, change management is one of those areas when I talk about technical change management, not organizational change management. Mm -hmm. It's got such a heavily, heavy focus and relationship between the people and technology processes that that's one that if there's not OCM, it's usually going to cause people to stray out of that process a little bit as much as they can um, yeah. because they don't feel like they've had the buy-in and they may not necessarily understand the process. So that's one of those good examples of like, where OCM, if you're having, you know, potentially issues in some of your processes, that may be one of those areas that um, that OCM can help is when we talk about technical change management. Absolutely. Okay. Um, shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk about um, development management. So this is one of those things and one of those areas that can sometimes be new um, for organizations, especially if this is maybe their first kind of like large scale cloud application that they're bringing into their environment. Um, and when we talk about managing development teams, we really want to make sure that we are leveraging those guiding principles. So this, the guiding principles are going to connect um, that technical governance board with the development teams. So that's how we're kind of overseeing those developers. So I've worked with organizations in the past that didn't have this. And when there are two or three contracted organizations plus in-house development teams, the development environments are just, for lack of a better term, they're just a nightmare. 
Um, people are stepping on each other, code's getting pushed, there's production problems, there's no uniformity, there's no standards, and it just, it honestly is, becomes very unruly. Um, so having those guiding principles, enforcing those standards, making sure that it's very clear that contracted and in-house resources are bubbling those customizations up to the governance boards. Um, and like Joe had mentioned, uh, having that communication between the teams, whether it's a weekly cadence, bi-weekly cadence, also having that informal ARB, so the architecture review board, um, to be able to talk about, I need to activate this plugin that may impact your project team, um, or this broke and my project team didn't work on that. Can somebody take a look at it? You know, that's going to be essential. Um, but also when we talk about managing development teams, we need to make sure that um, as specifically as a partner, this is going to skew my, my input on this a little bit, um, but requiring enablement from support to project teams. So if I, as a partner, implement a product and walk away and the client can't support it, that's a failure. So making sure that, that all project teams, regardless of internal or external, are providing documentation, testing, development standards, deployment standards, um, and doing knowledge transfer, that's a that's just that's a hard and fast rule for me. It has to be done. Um, part of that communication too is all going to be around, you know, publishing a shared release calendar, making sure that it's clearly communicated when clones are happening, when production deployments are happening, when upgrade, when patches are happening. That has to be known. Um, requiring ServiceNow has an automated testing framework. Um, requiring ATF for all development. Um, con connecting developers to any DevOps or CI CD pipeline that you have within your organization. Um, and ServiceNow also has a product around HealthScan. So we're trusting, but we're verifying through health scans that people are following our um, guiding principles and our development standards. Um, so there, there was a, a pre-webinar question that we had that was a great question around team sizing. Um, and my consultant's answer of that is it depends for team sizing. So the ServiceNow team that's internal to your organization can vary from a single administrator for smaller footprint um, to maybe multiple administrators, an in-house dedicated business analyst to a project master, a project manager, scrum master to multiple contracted development teams um, and or contracted development support resources. So it depends on the organization's ability, their comfort level doing that deployment and how large their service now deployment is within the organization. Yeah, a, a lot of what you speak to Ryan makes me think of that example I brought up earlier about that medical device manufacturer we had so many work streams and vendors working in different facets of the platform. What made us successful was establishing that regular cadence you mentioned to bring the team leads together, a program architecture call, an ARB. So we would conduct those calls. Each team would give their updates, what they're working on, what's going on. But it would also serve as that ARB. So if one group said, hey, we need to customize a platform, we, we have to change this thing or add this table or, or move this field, whatever, uh, they would have to describe what that requirement was and why their proposed solution is the best route. And, and our job on the ARB was play devil's advocate. Hey, we want to stay as out of box as possible. Why can't we leverage what we have here? Why doesn't this work? Remind them of our platform charter to stay as out of the box as possible. And, and this cadence we had, uh, it established constant communication across the teams. I mean, I was working in, in HR, ITSM, CMDB, I had another vendor working in GRC. So while we didn't always cross the streams, there were opportunities where they would say, hey, we need to customize this thing. And I'm thinking about it from a platform architect perspective, thinking, hey, if they change this, there's a licensing implication, there's technical debt, there's all that. And so we would address that in that call. And we'd also be communicating, like you said, about releases, change windows, clone dates for what was coming up and what was coming and going. On top of that, we required in-depth documentation, which sounds uh, laborious and monotonous, but not only did that give us traceability, but it also, when upgrades occurred and we got that upgrade report from ServiceNow, if something stood out, we could go back and point to, you know, why did we do this? How did we do this? When did we decide on this? Do we still need this? Is this still valuable? Because it was a fully vetted decision before we introduced something into the environment. So our future selves are very grateful for the diligence and documentation we put in. Absolutely, Joe. Um, <clears throat> okay, so shifting gears a little bit, I want to kind of talk about um, value and 
and I'm going to put some air quotes around ROI here because we're going to talk about what those two words necessarily mean within ServiceNow because there's the traditional word for that. Um, but some of the value in ROI that we're going to talk about is a little bit less tangible um, because there absolutely can be dollar costs associated and dollar benefits associated to a product like ServiceNow. But there's also some value and some ROI that is um, that is a little bit harder to measure. Um, but ServiceNow offers a framework uh, for this, and it's a framework that, that Joe and I both used a couple times and both really enjoy. Um, so it's, it's kind of a lightweight framework, again, just to make sure that you are maximizing the value from ServiceNow. So the first step really to now value is going to be that we're wanting to envision our value. So we want to understand what does good look like for the organization? What KPIs are we going to be checking against? Um, so this is really going to be kind of the planning session. So if you think back to um, to our demand board, so we've got maybe a qualified demand that comes in. It might move into something like an envision phase where we've got this demand, but what happens next? So what happens next is my absolute favorite phase. Um, this is going to be the create phase. So not only is this the point where we get to put hands on keyboards, we get to write code if needed, um, but this is really where we start to really fix and work on solving those business problems that may exist within the organization. Um, and if we were to talk about like the length of these arrows in a correlation to time, this create line would be significantly larger um, because this might encompass like a six, eight, 12 month engagement. Um, but it could also, you know, in, encompass something smaller. It could just be a quick win, depending on, you know, what's what's going to be needed to solve that business outcome. So after we're done with our create phase, we're going to move into our validate phase. And on the validate phase, that's where we're using those data and the metrics that were captured, you know, through create and at the end of create and checking it against the KPIs for Envision. And in a happy path, things would be coming out of this that, you know, yes, we met our KPIs. Yes, we've exceeded our KPIs. Maybe we didn't quite meet on this one because we didn't understand the business need initially. Um, and that's changed or the organization or business has changed and that's okay um, at the same time. But we're still validating because we, if we have, you know, kind of that unchecked development, there's no guarantee that what we're doing is successful and on the right path. From there, then we turn back to our business users and have them champion that success. So this is a wheel that is going to continue rolling throughout the environment. Um, it's going to, the cycle is going to start all over again with the next project or initiative, but this these champions are going to inspire others to start putting their demands in. And that's where we've got that demand board again to kind of help us qualify that and roll out our next phase. Okay, so let's kind of dig in a little bit on um, strategic alignment. So when we talk about the executive steering board, we talk about the roadmap, there may be a little bit of a gap there between how do we get what's on the roadmap and how do we know what we're wanting to get done? So we've got kind of a fictitious example here where we're going to talk about a CIO has given us some objectives or imperatives that over the next 18 to 24 months, they want to see us transform digital experiences. That's great. What exactly does that mean? That's kind of the big you know, $10,000 question here. Um, maybe we're also getting imperatives like we need to be more agile with IT. We need actionable insights with machine learning and artificial intelligence. Again, what does that mean? So with our strategic alignment, we can start to break those down into a little bit more actionable items with our outcomes. So what does it mean to transform the digital experience? Maybe that means low or no touch customer support. Maybe that means automating service providers. You know, maybe that means, you know, increasing self-service. Or if we're wanting to be more agile in our, in our IT, maybe we want to automate our level one tier one. Maybe we want to have more case deflection in tier zero. So these objectives and then outcomes, we're then going to lead into our kind of like ServiceNow strategic initiatives. So with our ServiceNow strategic initiatives, now we can start to break them down into more actionable chunks. And we're going to kind of take a look at that in the next step. So um, as we're taking a look at this, I've got a little bit of a disclaimer on this slide. So this is an example. These are not real numbers. Um, and for kind of value roadmaps, you can work with ServiceNow and your partners to be able to define that. 
Um, and value here, for example, is presented in dollars, um, but it doesn't necessarily um, need to know what exactly it is when it comes to value. So value doesn't necessarily need to be um, a tangible dollar value. It could be, for example, um, if I'm looking to decrease costs, that's a great tangible value. But if I'm wanting to have kind of a corollary value around increasing automation to free up agents so they can provide a better CSAT um, and better CSAT maybe boosts renewals depending on my business model. So those are things that we can talk about when we talk about value. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna skip ahead to the second one. So when we talk about a value roadmap here, we really wanna make sure that we're phasing it out and making sure that value for us is gonna be constant. Um, it's not gonna be a one-time thing. We're not just gonna get the value once from it because you're using ServiceNow day after day and you wanna make sure that you're getting value from ServiceNow day after day. So um, it needs a roadmap like the platform to ensure it's continual. So I wanted to take example of like running IT for scale here, for business scale. So maybe in 2022, our first phase of that is rolling out ServiceNow as application portfolio management. And there we're taking application inventories. We're finding redundant applications. We're cutting those out of our life. You know, all of those things that we don't necessarily need anymore. Then maybe we look at IT asset management or we look at software or licensing and software asset management, you know, to say we're paying $900,000 a year that we didn't know about in extra licenses. So those can get cut. And then maybe we need to be more agile in our IT so we can, you know, automate pieces. We can give our agents more time with the employees. And then maybe we wrap it all up with an optimization um, of our portfolio with the application landscape where we're re reducing applications, we're expanding features on existing applications to reduce that footprint. Those expansions can then lead into a project which can, can then go through um, and into ServiceNow, whether that application and project is managed maybe through ServiceNow, whether the application is ServiceNow itself. Um, it's all about driving that value for the organization as a whole. But we'll want to take all of our um, strategic initiatives that we kind of define for service now and have that value roadmap be available. And I kind of want to hit on that last value roadmap because there may not be a tangible benefit for something like continual compliance. Um, maybe the tangible benefit for us is that we don't get hit with a $500 million fine from the government. Um, that's something that necessarily is not, it's not necessarily easy to quantify. Um, maybe these are costs that are, and value that we get that we can propose out of some of these saying that, you know, we're potentially saving this money in fines. We're doing better for our services. We're providing the expectation and the quality that our customers expect. So some of those things that may be a little more tangible, um, they may have round numbers associated to them, but there can potentially be value attached to these. And this is really gonna kind of, go back into that executive steering board again to say like, here are these initiatives that we have from the CIO. Here's how we think the value that we're going to get out of them. Excuse me. And then here's how they should be stacked when we're defining that roadmap. So we can have that kind of like full circle connection um, between demands that are coming in, imperatives that are coming from the leadership, and then how that rolls into um, the demand board, executive board, and then application roadmaps. Okay, so um, with that, that was that was what we had to present today. So thank you for your time. I know that there's, I've just kind of seen the chat out of the corner of my eye and there's been a lot of movement and activity in the chat. Um, so thank you for reaching out. Um, Lindsay, I don't know if you wanna moderate a few questions for Joe and I, because we have um, about 10 minutes left. Yeah, happy to. Um, before we jump into questions, I'd like to do some marketing if I could. Um, what you see on this slide is um, the top two um, are uh, some resources on our website. So we've got a really extensive blog that we're extremely proud of. Um, and you can see the little screen grab there is from a recent article that our senior advisor, Kevin Jones, wrote on organizational change management. There's more where that came from. Uh, so please visit the blog. Um, relevant to this session, we do have two white papers um, on our resources page 
Um, if you're looking to migrate to ServiceNow, um, that'll help you there if you're looking to bring your data with you or if you just wanna get a lay of the land before you embark on the project. So things to keep an eye on. We also have um, for the practitioners among us, a pretty extensive YouTube uh, playlist with how to's for ServiceNow. It's a, a really great resource if you just need a quick, oh, how do you do that? It's, um, it's a good place to go for that. Um, so with that, let me read this first question verbatim because I think it's the best question I've ever gotten in almost eight years of doing this job. If moving to ServiceNow, does ServiceNow or your company provide expertise such as you're providing here to help large scale customers get the most out of ServiceNow? Take it away. <laughs> so I'll take a stab at this one and then Joe, I'll probably default to you. So, um, so the, sure. the short answer to that question is yes. Um, the longer answer to that question is um, it is in both ServiceNow and your partner's best interest um, to make sure that you are getting the most out of ServiceNow. Um, and what that means is really understanding your organization and understanding kind of the, the needs. So um, there, we sometimes do engagements with customers ahead of time to kind of define at a high level like, if we've got a customer saying, I have all these business problems, what can we do first? That prioritization can be a little bit daunting. Um, so we've done engagements, both Joe and I have done consultative engagements where we're helping understand the business need, kind of helping build out some of that value roadmap, build out some of the organizational and application roadmap, um, and then helping you prioritize, you know, what's going to start when. So Joe, I don't know if you've got additional thoughts there. Yeah, a, a large part of my job is when a customer says, "Hey, I want to like, I want to fast forward to the end where everything's great." And what Ryan and I do is like, okay, well, to do that, you have to start here, start from where you are, establish your roadmap. So uh, to answer the question directly, uh, yes, and Beyond Twenty definitely does that. Uh, any um, great partner will do that, like Beyond Twenty, uh, and and Ryan and I have. Uh, 20 years experience between us of uh, helping uh, large scale customers get the most out of their platform. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, so sure. we had a question that came in toward the beginning of the session. Um, could you, Ryan, navigate back to that <clears throat> platform of platforms slide? I can do that. Leave my marketing slide. I'm so proud of that marketing slide. <laughs> Uh, so this is in the chat. Um, does ServiceNow have a particular strength among the functions at the bottom, i.e. IT, infrastructure, customer service, et cetera? So I'll give my opinion on this and I'll have Joe answer his opinion. So ServiceNow started, and I'm going to use some air quotes, was started as, uh, as an ITSM tool. Um, and my opinion on ServiceNow starting was um, an ITSM tool was built on top of a great platform because they could sell the ITSM tool because it was harder to sell a vague concept of a platform. So it's been ITSM longest. Um, but when we talk about a real strength, I think it's going to be all of them. So ServiceNow is just an amazing platform and kind of a, a personal story. Um, many, many years ago, I uh, took over ServiceNow and knew nothing about it. And I went to, to San Diego for the sysadmin class and like, Halfway through the first day, my mind was just blown with the configuration options that we had because I'd worked on other cloud platforms before. Um, so kind of circling back to that, I think it's the strength is the platform. The strength is um, the shared data model. Um, but I'll leave it to Joe for your opinion. Yeah, I totally agree. And as I look at you know, some of the, the other platforms mentioned, like Adobe, Oracle, SAP, uh, don't expect ServiceNow to replace Workday. But ServiceNow as that single pane of glass, that system of engagement, uh, I agree with Ryan, like the strengths are yes. Uh, yes, it started as ITSM, that's where the biggest need was. But as they've expanded across other verticals and other areas of the platform, like they, they do that well, they, they unify what services you have available at your organization and then provide a, a single system of engagement. And if they're not the system of records, say you have Workday, say you have Salesforce, to provide a seemingly seamless experience for the users to interact with those systems. I think it's a great time to mention before I turn it back to you, Lindsay, is when you see those systems across the bottom too, um, ServiceNow has recognized the need to be able to connect with those. And as part of its positioning that this is the platform of platforms and single pane glass, there are a lot of pre-built integrations into these areas. Um, and as running projects on a day-to-day -day basis that makes my life so much easier um so i just kind of want to call that out that like there's continual improvement within the the 
the product itself, where we're seeing out-of-box integrations to SAP. We're seeing out-of-box integrations to Workday, things that you just turn on, credential, and they just work. So Yeah, not just integrations, but if you look at release notes, um, you can pull slides from ServiceNow that show the iterative change, and it's huge. You see this laundry list, and like, oh, that must be comprehensive what they changed over the last four or five releases. No, that's just like new improvements they put in in this release that they do twice a year. Uh, they're they're constantly like looking like, hey, what do our customers need? You know, what's the niche out there, and how can we serve that? And so the speed at which ServiceNow has continued to grow and evolve is is astounding, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try to squeeze one more in. I have a long and storied history of trying to consolidate questions that actually shouldn't be consolidated. So bear with me. Okay, I have one question around, what if your initial implementation uh, went horribly wrong? Uh, how do you write the ship? Where do you start? Um, and I think possibly related to that would be, um, how do you start to consolidate things if you have maybe several instances of service now? Do you start with guiding principles? How do you kind of, get your act together in either of those scenarios? Those are both big questions. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'll, knew I'll, it. Start, <laughs> I'll start and throw it to Joe. Um, so I think on the initial implementation question, if things didn't go well, um, I think my initial response is that's okay. I mean, it's it happens. I think one of my, one of my big pieces is the, the vendor customer relationship and it shouldn't just be vendor it should be partner so a lot of times when i've seen implementations not go well it can kind of usually be traced back to a couple of things and one of them is like stakeholder engagement the other one is uh, maybe not a right fit for partner and customer um, and it could just be that um, it wasn't a good time within the organization the commitment wasn't there the buy-in wasn't there um, so that gets into a much bigger question of like, what do we do next, I think? <clears throat> and the what do we do next can, de can be determined like how far out of box you are. I mean, if you've, if you've gone down a path with a partner where you're so far out of box, I think it's reasonable to start having the questions of, do we start over? Um, and if you're not that far out of box, then I think it's reasonable to have the conversations around what needs to be fixed to get us back closer to out of box and to help us get a little more value out of service now. So that's kind of my high level snippet joe yeah you, you talk about engagement and I, I think of implementations where oh we hired you know x vendor to come on board so i can just go on autopilot and leave that like well no you're the one that's gonna be left with this product at the end of the day so your input is paramount as a vendor like we don't know how your day-to-day -day operations run like we need your input to know what good looks like to achieve that objective and if i <laughs> i have encountered customers were, hey, we went with customer with vendor X, you know, things didn't go great, here we are. I always take it back to that roadmap slide of like, okay, like start from where you are, you know, how's your financial data, like what's the next step? What's your roadmap? And and start achieving small victories to help build up to riding the ship. What I wouldn't expect is like overnight, oh, I went with partner B and now they, you know, turned water to wine and my instance is great again. No, that's an unrealistic expectation. And what we really want to do is, okay, what are we executing well? What do we need to start, stop, and continue? And then define our roadmap from there. That's a great call, Joe. Thank you. I'd, I'd forgotten about that because that's so very important to have that iterative progress. Again, we hit it multiple times. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> with the final minute, Lindsay, I'm going to try and answer the, the multi-instance question because that's, that, is, um, that is a large, a large, large question. Um, so one of the things that, that I typically do when we talk about instance consolidation is start to identify the needs. So there are some valid reasons for instances to be separated, um, and some of those valid instances typically tie back to government regulations. So if there's no government regulations in your area or industry for separation of data, then start looking at the commonalities between them, um, and then start working on a roadmap to define what's been configured from baseline for each instance, what can be reverted to out of box, how can we bring those two together into a single production instance. And then I think that's going to impact um, the project that is going to be, you know, a, what is potentially going to be a large undertaking as I've had in the past um, to be able to, to have that happen. 
Um, so that's really going to be the first step is identifying the differences, identifying the needs, and then starting to define a plan to get people back together. So that's a probably a much longer conversation that would be probably a, a good topic for um, for a blog article in the future. But um, that's where I would probably start initially. So I don't know, Joe, if you've got any other final thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Thinking about that example I used in the slides about the company that underwent a divestiture, like they were going from one set of instances to their own to stand up by themselves. And it was really boiling it down, like you said, Ryan, like what are the needs? Like what do you need to track today when it comes to, say, incident management? What do you, what do you have and can trust about your CIs that you could bring into service now to start to unify those things? And, and really, I think where customers trip themselves up is they try to do too much at once and setting up that strong foundation that I had highlighted earlier, really, that's where it's at. Like you don't feel the need to like lift and shift because you're bringing like bad process, bad habits with it, but like take a step back, look at the whole board and say, hey, no, what do I do today that I do really well? Start there and then, okay, what, what needs a little bit of improvement? Let's add that on and let's add that on. And then that, that'll slowly build momentum to, to standing on, like I said before, your own two feet to, uh, to unify the, the, the platform is coming off of. And I, I saw a question in the chat too about to find a large scale customer for me, uh, mine was a large global organization, probably like 70 to 80,000 employees, and, and they were all over the world. And so I've had them from a small mom and pop shop to a large conglomerate organization. So when I speak large scale, I'm talking large global, you know, using a lot of the platform, have a lot of business users and just, just work constantly ebbing and flowing. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for your time. Yeah. I appreciate it. Sorry, Linda, I'll turn it back. No, no, you. that's okay. That, I, I was going to say that exact same thing. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your time. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, get in touch if you've got any additional questions. I know we've got some yep. unanswered uh, still kind of floating. We'll get back to you individually on those. But um, you'll get uh, an email from me with the recording of this session, either later today or tomorrow. And I hope you have a lovely rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining.